Let's talk about the small molecule inhibitors. I think there's a lot of data that's being reported here at, at ASH 2015. Uh, with regard to the small molecule inhibitors. I think what we'd like to do is start with ibrutinib and, and have an idea from Susan how she thinks ibrutinib has changed the landscape in CLL. I mean, obviously, it's changed enormously. We touched on the fact that, you know, the biggest complication and mo most frequent and most feared with chemoimmunotherapy is myelosuppression and infection in a patient population who, for other reasons uh, tend to have infections already, right, because of the immunosuppression associated with their disease, their dysfunctional T cells, hypogamma globulinemia, et cetera. I think one of, you know, I think one of the biggest advantages of the BSAR receptor inhibitors, and this sometimes gets lost a little bit because the efficacy is so good that you focus on that, is that they're not myelosuppressive. And not only are they not myelosuppressive, but they, you know, improve, cytopenias actually improve. And that's really very interesting because we used to say that with chemo, cytopenias will improve, but in the beginning they, they won't because you get myelosuppression because you have to clear out the bone marrow, right? Well, clearly, the, the, I don't know the exact mechanism of action here, but the, CL, the cytopenias are improving even when there's, the lymphocyte count could be 100,000. Although, so, so it's a little more complicated than that. It's not this simplistic idea of clearing out the marrow. So I think that's one of the, the hugest advantages of these new molecules and the, that enables us to more easily give them to older, older patients in particular, where again, if an older 75-year-old gets pneumonia and they wind up in the hospital, they're gonna be completely deconditioned by the time they get out. So obviously efficacy is good, durability is good, but I think one of the, the main advantages that changed the whole landscape um, is, is the lack of myelosuppression and, and there are some infections because of the nature of the population, but not because we're myelosuppressing these people. Yeah, Alessandra, you've done a lot of work at Anderson with the elderly population and there's a trial that's being reported for the first time here at this ASH meeting referred to as the Resonate 2 trial. I wonder if you could give us your opinion on the results of the Resonate, maybe summarize what, what your what your understanding is of the Resonate 2. Um, there hasn't been data necessarily yet reported. There was a, a, a press release. But perhaps you can comment on what your thoughts are on the Resonate 2 trial. Yes, the Resonate 2 trial will be presented um, at this meeting and is a cooperative study that look at uh, ibrutinib randomized to corambucil. This was in elderly patients with indication for therapy. Uh, it's a trial where we already know the answer. And that is that the results with the brutinib are superior in terms of overall response rate, in terms of uh, complete response rate, but there is also a, a superiority in terms of survival, even if a crossover was allowed in this trial, although later in, during the conduction of the trial. I think what we are all surprised is how big of a difference we are uh, seeing because the results show that the uh, response rate is close to 90% with uh, the ibrutinib and also the survival, um, the difference in survival is quite uh, marked with an 85% improvement in survival with that uh, relatively short follow-up and therefore it's gonna be improved over time. Dr. Ma, you've, I'm sure you've used quite a bit of ibrutinib. What are the, some of the things that you uh, look for in patients who are, you're starting on ibrutinib? What are some of the side effects that you uh, monitor for and, ha and how do you mitigate those in, uh, mm -hmm. problems? Right, so the most common side effects of ibrutinib is the GI side effects. So diarrhea and uh, nausea can occur and uh, typically mostly grade one and two and tends to resolve after the first two, three months of treatment. Uh, but one important thing I do educate the patient is that there is an increased risk of bleeding for patients who are taking ibrutinib. So you have to educate the patient to um, uh, watch out for any signs of bleeding, but also if the patient is gonna go, go over any invasive procedure or sur such as surgery or a tooth extraction, then they have to hold the ibrutinib, uh, consider holding the drug for a few days before and a few days after the procedure. Um, another thing to watch out for is atrial fibrillation. Uh, so in the randomized trials, there is an increased incidence of uh, atrial fibrillation for patients who are taking ibrutinib compared to ofatumumab arm in, uh, in the resident study. Um, so for elderly patients, atrial fibrillation is not an uncommon problem, so that's something you have to educate the patient on. So 
So those are the most common side effects we'll be watching for. So the, we, t we mentioned the Resonate 2 trial. There's another trial that's being updated at this ASH. Maybe Susan can comment on that, and that is the Resonate 17 trial, which is an ibut ibrutinib monotherapy-based trial. Right, so that's actually the largest trial ever in, in, a, in a 17P deleted population. I think it's about 144 patients, and that data, the clinical uh, data, ha, uh, efficacy data has been presented and it will be updated here, but in the important point about what's being presented here is the results by uh, molecular analysis. Uh, if we just look at the, the efficacy results, we say, not unexpectedly, as we saw it in the prior trials, a very high response rate in 17P deleted patients. Um, that there is yet no median progression-free survival, but that's because the follow-up is about a year. So uh, we wouldn't have expected to see a median at that point. Uh, this analysis is going to look at various different types of mutations, uh, P53, Notch, Burke one et cetera, and, and try to look at, well, is there any difference in response rate, uh, a mutated versus unmutated, heavy chain gene, et cetera, and uh, clearly showing that thus far, and, and again, can't say much about progression-free survival yet, but in terms of response, there's really, there's really no difference. So the patients who historically have what we would consider uh, bad mutations or bad, poor prognosis mutations, such as p53, for example, uh, seem to respond just as well as patients who don't. Again, we'll see what we'll see with longer follow-up what plays out in terms of progression-free survival. But at least we can say for response rates, they don't seem to be making a difference. So in the era of ibrutinib, do you think 17P is still a high-risk feature? Yes. And are there subgroups among the 17P deleted patients that potentially are high, at higher risk than, than others? Well, we know from the paper that you published with the Mayo that that's true at diagnosis, right? That if you take all patients with 17P at diagnosis, which is not a very common abnormality, 5 to 8%, that about half of those patients required therapy within one year, which is sort of what you might have intuitively expected based on the fact that it's high-risk disease. But then there was a whole subset of patients that went years without any therapy. And if we looked at them right, they were more likely to be mutated, they were more likely to be rise stage zero, and they, the, the clone was smaller, so the number of cells was 17P. However, I think that once a patient actually with 17P progresses to the point of needing therapy, I think there's very little, or if there is, I don't think it's very clear what it is, that mitigates their poor prognosis. As Tom said earlier, there are occasionally people who can get a durable response with FCR, but they are so, they're such in the minority that for practical purposes, I think it's, you know, it's just, if they progress to needing treatment and they have 17P, you almost don't even need to know anything else. Now that may turn out to not be correct. Again, if we have longer PFS follow-up and we may find out that, you know, notch one mutation and, P and 17P deletion are, are even, are, are worse with ibrutinib. I don't think we're in a position to know that yet.